Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, welcome to the Paranormal Portal. It's Saturday night. That's a great night, and I am here to entertain the hell out of you because that's what I try to do every time I turn on the microphone, and hopefully it works. Hopefully you guys leave here feeling entertained and enjoying yourselves and, and maybe learning something or another for, about this strange paranormal uh I want to say a special thank you to those of you who have been emailing me. I've been getting a, uh, a flurry of emails lately, uh, people sharing experiences and sharing things that have happened to them. And it's, it's really, uh, really in, intriguing and, and incredible to hear your stories. So, uh, you know, it's not all just about being on the show or, or contributing something for the show. If you just want to talk about what you've experienced and what you've seen, um, by all means, please feel free to email me. Um, if you just want a, a little feedback on what you're going through, uh, that would be fine. I love hearing from you guys uh, about what you've experienced because, I don't know, I take I take something from each encounter and uh, it, it adds to my, I don't know, my thought process, I guess, about this strange phenomena that we're surrounded with. So thank you to those of you who have emailed and uh, if you've got something that you want to talk about, by all means, email me to any of you who haven't. And, uh, if any of you, uh, have a, have a bunch of stories and want to be a guest on the, on the podcast, by all means, email me as well. And you can do all of those emails by sending them to paranormal portal radio at gmail.com. And, uh, they'll get to me and, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, I'll be happy to talk with you or, or have you on the shows if, you know, if there's enough that we can work with or, you know, whatever, just, uh, love talking to you guys. I love getting a chance to meet you all because, you know, a lot of times I'm doing the show, I'm speaking to a microphone, I'm looking at a camera and this is an opportunity to interact with you. Speaking of interacting, uh, just want to throw this out there in September. Uh, we are going to be going to Vernal, Utah. And when we're there, there, the reason we're going there in case you haven't heard, or uh, haven't 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 heard me mention this on the shows before, but we are going to be going to Phenomicon, ladies and gentlemen, and this will be happening in Vernal, Utah, uh, eighth September eighth through the eleventh of twenty twenty two. Obviously, this year, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why is the the year like I don't know. Sometimes things just come out and I'm like, what did I do that for? Well, it's going to be this year, 8th through the 11th of September in Vernal, Utah. And this is an area that's actually really close to Skinwalker Ranch. And, uh, you know, a lot of strange stuff goes on up there, of course. And the surrounding area has quite a bit of phenomena reported as well. So there's a lot of things going on. But look at these speakers and presenters that are going to be involved in this. And these are some really incredible names and uh, personalities in the paranormal and uh, supernatural Fordian uh, um, you know, world. Uh, we're going to have uh, April Slaughter, who's a paranormal investigator. Dr. Jeff Meldrum will be there. Russell Accord, along with uh, Ronnie LeBlanc and Maria Mayer, uh, Dr. Maria Mayer of Expedition Bigfoot will be there as well. And uh, uh, D Adam Davis will be there and Bob Gimlin and just a whole bunch of other uh, incredible individuals will be taking part in this. So if you're looking to get involved and, and head on down to Phenomicon, check out uh, phenomicon.net. And at the bottom of the page at phenomicon.net, you'll see the scheduled uh, events that are that are supposed to be taking place. And there's so much going on, not only with the actual conference, but uh, other things going on around the conference, including ghost hunts. I think there's something going on where they're going to go out to uh, Skinwalker Ranch area. Check that out. And so it sounds like just this amazing event. Don and I will be there, perhaps Sheldon too, if we can swing it. Uh, but we're going to be there and it'd be great to meet you if you happen to be in the neighborhood or can be in the neighborhood. Um, you know, certainly meeting Bob is, is uh, just an incredible thing all in, in and of itself. He's the godfather of our modern Bigfoot movement and uh, just the nicest, most sweet, genuine uh, person that you'll ever meet. And, uh, it's, and he loves meeting people. He, I, I <laughs> I've been at a couple of conferences with Bob and, uh, Bob's knocking on 90 years old, and, and uh, he might even be 90 by now. I'm not sure, e either 89 or 90, but that guy has more stamina than I have and maybe have ever had. He's on his feet all day long out there in the, in the sun and the heat meeting people at both conferences that I was at, and he's just like the Energizer Bunnies, and he's genuinely thrilled to meet people. So if you get a chance, 
this is one of those uh, one of those events that you may not want to miss because who knows how much longer Bob's going to be making any appearances. So take advantage of it if you can. Again, this is uh, Phenomicon in Vernal, Utah. Go to phenomicon.net to, for more information, including tickets, and uh, they have information on accommodations in the area as well. So, uh, so much going on. Check it out, phenomicon.net. And uh, I want to take a moment to thank the Paranormal Portal sponsor, and this, of course, is Cryptid Coin. And Cryptid Coin is a great new opportunity for crypto investments. If you're into that, this may be a great avenue for you because they have cryptid research and investigation at the heart of their of their mission. So um, it's a great way to invest in the community and you're investing in cryptid research and investigations. Uh, for more information, go to cryptidcoin.io. Again, cryptidcoin.io. And uh, you can learn so much more. And remember, it's, it's available now on PancakeSwap. So that uh, just makes it easier to get involved, if you so choose. Um, so special thank you to Cryptid Coin for, uh, for sponsoring or helping to sponsor the Paranormal Portal at any rate. But uh, check it out. Um, but we got a lot on the board tonight. It's just me and you. So uh, you guys are, are my co-hosts tonight as well. You are every night, but <laughs> tonight as well. Oh, good to see Nate. I saw Nate Rudd in the, in the house. Good to see you, brother. Nate's a, 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 a Bigfoot investigator himself and uh, has been involved in lots of things, including uh, uh, he'll be on an upcoming episode of, of, uh, um, of uh, <laughs> me and names, uh, Jack Osborne's show where he does, uh, does Bigfoot investigating. Well, he's doing, he did one up in this area and Nate is up here and uh, was, was involved in that. So very cool. Really excited to see that when it comes out. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, I, I've watched a few of Jack Osborne's different paranormal things that he's done, and they are really pretty well put together. So uh, definitely check it out. He's got Jason Muse with him on this one, of course. That's uh, Jay from Jay and Silent Bob uh, from you know the the Dogma movie, and uh, I I don't I don't know what he's like, but it'll be interesting to see. So anyway, that'll be coming up. Welcome, Nate. Good to see you, brother. Um. Okay, so I guess there's nothing better to do at this point than to check out the news. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paranormal Portal News Desk, where I will bring you the news that I've sought fit to bring you. So (laughs) first up on our roster of fun tonight in the Paranormal Portal News is an article from uh, unexplained-mysteries.com. And this article is uh, kind of a concerning one to me because, you know, know, I'm not a conspiracy person per se, but I will say that it's surprising how much stuff people have flouted as conspiracy theories that actually turned out to be truth, (laughs) you know. And that's that's a little disconcerting. So whenever you hear a conspiracy theory, you're like, well, is that really, could that really be happening? And, uh... I don't know, but here's here's one that kind of has my attention right now, and we'll see what you guys think. But it says new reactive chemical found in the Earth's atmosphere. Well, how'd that get there? <laughs> I don't know. Let's find out what it says. I haven't pre-read this, so we're all going to learn together. And probably, yeah, it's not too long, so it's good. It says known as trioxides, these highly reactive chemicals could be contributing to health and environmental problems. I know I, I can't hardly start a morning without my trioxides. <laughs> I'd like to add some to my coffee. Uh, scientists have long suspected that trioxides, chemical compounds with three oxygen atoms, would one day be found in our planet's atmosphere. And now, thanks to the work of researchers at the University of Copenhagen, their presence has finally been unequivocally proven for the first time. Well, maybe they were always there, you know. We can now show through direct observation that these compounds actually form in the atmosphere, then they are surprisingly stable and they are formed from almost all chemical compounds, said study co-author Jing Chen. All speculation must now be put to rest. The existence of trioxides in the Earth's atmosphere is concerning, not least because mm, excuse me, They are highly reactive and could be contributing to the whole host of health problems, including heart and respiratory diseases. Well, I'm here to tell you, I I can't ever remember a time when I've heard of so many people having respiratory illnesses. And so maybe it's the trioxides. Who knows? 
Do they spray those from planes? I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> it's also likely they are having an effect on climate change. The, co- the type of compounds we discovered are unique in their structure. Uh, it's, it says, uh, um, and because they are extremely oxidizing, they most likely bring a host of effects that we have yet to uncover. Further study will no doubt be needed to understand exactly what these effects might be. I'm sure none of them are good, but then again, maybe they're just getting sick of us and like, <laughs> you guys, you guys are evicted. That's it. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, folks, if you didn't know that now, you know, there are now trioxides in our atmosphere, proven at least now. And uh, again, uh, <laughs> not, I'm not trying to promote any kind of uh, weird conspiracy stuff because I don't pretend to know enough to, be, to, to have an opinion on most of that. But it is concerning that they found them up there, and it doesn't sound like they're good to have. So I'm, I'm all for let's get rid of them. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but uh, hopefully they're working on it. So that's the first article up on uh, the news tonight, the news. Let's see what's next. What else did I grab for you? Well, funny you should ask, because the next one up is also from uh, unexplained-mysteries.com. And it's a great site, folks. Check, definitely check them out. Um, they, they do a phenomenal job. And there's all kinds of these bite-sized articles full of great information that you can get a hold of over there. And uh, so definitely support them. A lot of these sites are run by people just doing it on their own blood, sweat, and tears. So any support, visits, traffic you can give them is a good thing. So uh, I advocate checking them out. Uh, this one is, and I'm, I don't know, I, should, I didn't even look at how long this one is. No, this one's okay, too. It's pretty short. I'm not even sure what it meant, but I saw the, I saw the title and went, what? So the article is, Mermaid Bed Found at Site of 2,100-Year-Old Burial in Greece. Not sure what a mermaid bed is, but let's find out. Archaeologists have unearthed the skeleton of a woman who was buried on a bed adorned with images of, mer- of mermaids. Oh, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's not exactly what I thought I was getting into here. The fascinating burial site, which was discovered near the city of Kozani in northern Greece, dates back 2,100 years to the first century B.C. and contains a number of intriguing artifacts. The woman, whoever she was, must have been some of some importance as she was buried on a bronze bed featuring the image of a bird with a snake in its mouth, uh, thought to represent the Greek god of Apollo, uh, as well as bedposts adorned with depictions of mermaids. Gold leaves were found suggesting that the woman had been buried wearing a wreath as were golden threads indicative of some form of embroidery. Artifacts, uh, including four clay pots and glass vessels, were also found buried alongside of her, and archaeologists are now working to determine more about the woman, such as the cause of her death and how old she was when she died. So far, the only thing that can be ascertained from the burial is that she most likely came from a wealthy background. Yeah, I'm I'm betting if she she had a, a metal bed with mermaids engraved and stuff in it, and they were willing to put it in the dirt with her, they probably had some money. Uh, but very interesting. There's a picture for those of you on uh, YouTube. You can see this. It's nothing that remarkable. You just see this, what's left of some bed posts and side rails and a skeleton in the, in the middle. So, um, but I guess, I guess that's significant. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's just because, Hey, there was mermaids <laughs> were believed to be around back then or, or whatever. I don't know. It is in, it is uh, kind of unique though. Not the kind of stuff you hear about every day. And yeah, uh, remember you heard it here on the news. All right, the next one up is from unexplained-mysteries.com comes a story that is, this one's kind of interesting. So if any of you have dreamed of uh, becoming involved in the the future space program, you might need some upgrades. That's all I'm going to say. Let me look at this too. Is this one? No, this one's good too. All right, because if you, you, you might need to get a hardware upgrade in the tune of Future space pioneers could be flesh, blood, and electronics. There you go. See, you you know what? Elon's always ahead of the curve on this stuff. He's been talking about this for a while. And maybe he's the one that came up with this idea. But it says, Astronomer Royal Royal Martin Rees has suggested that cybernetics could facilitate humanity's future among the stars. The human body is certainly not built for space exploration, 
Whether we venture beyond our, the protective atmosphere of our own world, it is necessary to cocoon ourselves within a carefully constructed vessel or orbital platform, and even that doesn't entirely keep us safe. In order to truly thrive in space and on other worlds, therefore, we may eventually have to accept that our bodies are just not up to the task and that some sort of upgrade might be in order. According to astronomer Royal Martin Rees, cybernetic augmentation could be the key to truly thriving away from our planet uh, and to make it possible for us to live safely on other worlds. Speaking during this year's Hay Festival, <laughs> it sounds like some agricultural thing. It doesn't sound like he was the right speaker for the event, but let's see what is this. He described how future Mars explorers could be a mixture of flesh, blood, and electronics. These intrepid explorers on Mars will be out of the clutches of the regulators and they will have every incentive to modify themselves because they are very badly adapted for Mars, he said. They will use all these techniques to adapt themselves within a generation or two. They could become a quite different species. We don't know what mixture they will be of flesh and blood and electronics, but if they become electronic, then of course they could be near immortal. If that's the case, they would be able to make a very long interstellar voyage hibernating for millennia. Wow. So <laughs> we're going to be sending out master chiefs and, and iron men out there or something. I don't know. That's very crazy. Maybe that is, maybe that is a, a future of some kind, but I don't know who's stepping up first on that plate because, you know, <laughs> if they haven't done it before, you don't want to be one of the first ones to try to sort it out. That's pretty, that's pretty wild. Wow. Maybe we could just make things that fly faster. How about that? All right. Well, let's get to the next one on the roster of fun tonight. And this is from also unexplained-mysteries.com. And this one is brand new. It's from the bizarre category. Let me take a look at the time here to see where we're at. Cause uh, sometimes I get a little long winded. We're good. Okay. So this one is also from unexplained-mysteries.com. Oh, what the hell? I didn't mean to pull this one up. I think I, I got to wait on this one because it actually has a video element. I'm going to show it on Wednesday on uh, on the show then. So um, let me let me skip to the next one here. Sorry, folks. This one is... The <laughs> this one is from the archives, and I, I pulled it up because I thought it was so funny. Um, apparently, you got to make sure that you're getting what you paid for, especially if you're going to a zoo in China because... In China, you might you might not be seeing what you think you're seeing. Lion exposed as dog at Chinese zoo. <laughs> Visitors to a zoo in China found out the, found themselves somewhat underwhelmed by some of the animals on display. Suspicions were raised when visitors expecting to see a spectacle of an African lion in one of the enclosures were met instead by a much smaller creature that started started it started barking at them. <laughs> It's not what lions do. Uh, I, saw, I saw the Lion King. They never barked. Uh, it turned out the lion was, in fact, a Tibetan mastiff, a dog with a distinctive furry brown coat. The, the zoo is absolutely trying to cheat us, complained one visitor, and they're trying to disguise dogs as lions. <laughs> oh, no. When questioned about the incident, the chief of the park's animal department told the local newspaper that the lion had been taken away to a breeding facility and that the dog had been placed in the enclosure for safety reasons. Oh, really? <laughs> an animal described as an African lion at a Chinese zoo was exposed as a fraud when the creature started barking in front of visitors. <laughs> it, was, it was just in there for safety reasons, folks. It wasn't there. They weren't trying to fool anybody. And if they were, they really should probably get up a little early in the morning because, yeah, lions don't bark. That's that's absolutely hilarious. Wow. That's what is it P.T. Barnum said? There's there's a sucker born every minute or something like that. <laughs> in this case, it wasn't the it wasn't the zoo goers, it was the people running the deal. But that's that's absolutely hilarious. Wow. This is an old one, though. It's from uh, August 18th of 2013, but I found it. I was like, oh, no, we got to read that one. That's too funny. <laughs> yeah, you just never know, folks. You just never know. Let's get to the next one on the roster, and this is the last one for the night in the newscast because uh, the news just goes quick. 
especially like maybe I'm reading too fast. All right. Let's see what this one is. Um, <laughs> this one's also a pretty old one. And, uh, no, I can't even say it out. I, I, there's so many things I want to say, but I gotta, I gotta apply my filter pretty carefully here because I don't want to sound like a jerk. Uh, it was just funny, just the funny things that come through my head, but I'll read you the article. Maybe you can fill in the blanks of what I couldn't say, but, uh, I don't know. All right. And this is from unexplained-mysteries.com. Woman glues her own mouth shut. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what's wrong with her. We haven't argued for weeks. <laughs> in a bizarre incident, a woman in New Zealand accidentally managed to glue her lips together. Oh, my God. The peculiar incident, incident occurred when a 64-year-old reached for her dry lip medication while in bed and instead picked up a tube of super glue. Oh, oh dear God. <laughs> she, fooned, she, she, fooned. she soon found that she was unable to open her mouth at all and was forced to call an ambulance. Dispatchers responded to the call, believing that she had been gagged because of the limited sound she was able to make. She got up in the middle of the night in the dark, grabbed what she thought was the tube of medication, said Senior Sergeant Steve Aitken, and it was an extremely frightening ex event for her because her breathing was impeded. Oh, that's, that is scary. I've heard of a few other things super glued, but never lips. <laughs> oh, that poor woman, she super glued her lips. I don't know, is there a solvent that you can use for that? Or, or I, I don't know. I've heard some people claim that, you know, yeah, I, I remember one guy was talking about, oh, we used to do it with just warm water. And I glued my fingers together once trying to repair something. And I was, I was trying warm water and that didn't help me much. So that stuff is like really bound. I don't know. Do they have to peel the lips then? Oh, that poor woman. Oh, but it, it's, it's humorous, but it's also tragic. That's, that's really, that's really pretty sad. Oh. But my <laughs> no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm I'm dying to, but I can't because uh, I'm not really a, 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 a one of those one of those guys that loves to put people down. But it, it's just the funny things that pop into my head. But ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our newscast for the night. So let's get back to the regular stuff, if you will. Oops, wrong button. <laughs> Do not glue your lips shut, um, but if you do, feel free to chat because the chat doesn't require your lips. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get on the Paranormal Portal News, but I always try to keep it interesting, and I hope you found that. There's a new name, one, 1325 Dick's Drive. Okay, um, my aunt super glued her eyelids with super glue, thinking it was her eye antibiotic. Oh, my God. Oh, how did that end? I would love to hear how that ended, if you don't mind. That is absolutely tragic, especially your eyes. Oh, that's scary because, I mean, that is actually a very strong uh, chemical in, that's in those, and I'm sure it, it probably burned her eyes a little bit too. That's just bizarre. Huh. But it's nice to see a new names uh, pop up. That's always exciting because, yeah. It's neat to, to do these shows and uh, find new people all the time. And so thank you so much for coming in and checking out the show. And I hope you like it and get subscribed because we'd love to see you continue to be a part of our, our broadcast. Um, so we're just coming up to the first break, ladies and gentlemen. It'll be in about, about a minute from now. But um, just if you're new to the shows on Friday and Saturday, we are broadcasting not only on YouTube, where the majority of you are, but we're also broadcasting on TFR Live, which is simulcast on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and TalkStream Live. So we do have to take these uh, uh, half-hour breaks. And so for those of you on YouTube, you'll see uh, like a video compilation, compilation that I put together along with some music. But those of you on the networks, of course, you'll get the actual commercials. So um, I sometimes get messages like, man, why do you have to, why do you have to take the breaks? Um, but it's, it's because we are simulcasting. And so breaks are a part of the, a part of our Friday, Saturday shows. So, but don't worry if you, if you just stick around, we'll come back in just a couple minutes and continue the journey into the paranormal portal. So, um, it's just momentarily. 
And uh, if you can stick it out, we'll always be back. But when we come back, we got a lot of things to go through. Uh, there's several different things we're going through tonight. We're going to do some uh, paranormal uh, weirdness stories. We're going to do s- some uh, Bigfoot stories later in the show, uh, uh, both from Sasquatch Chronicles blog as well as Phantoms and Monsters. So there's lots on the roster tonight, folks. So stick with us and uh, or with us with me. It's me. <laughs> There's the bell, folks. We're going to take the first break now, and we will be right back before you know it. Don't go away.
Well, we made it. First break is down. Wow, that happened pretty quick. And I uh, hope you guys are doing wonderful out there. Thank you so much for being here, all of you. I see Bam and Jim and I are in TFR. Good to see you guys there. Thanks for tuning in. And let's take a peek at who's who's in the YouTube. So if you want to shout out, definitely type something if you would, because uh, otherwise the list doesn't populate. Um, it only populates for the active chatters, and that's even within a certain time frame. So keep chatting. Uh, I'm going to do uh, shout outs now. We got 1325 Dick's Drive. A ghost is in here. Hi, a ghost. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming in and checking out the show. Uh, Aggravated Progressive. Deb Varner, our very own psychic on the Paranormal Portal. Digger Dog is here. Drake C. Elaine is here. Jeff Meyer. Jeffrey Dixon. Just been just there and just here and there. <laughs> 66. Sorry. Uh, it's just a crunch of words. So Lori Barnes, Maggie M10, uh, Pam Whit Whitus or Whitus. Good to see you. I'm here. Portal mom is here. That's actually my mom folks. So you're hanging out with my mom. So be nice. Be good. Uh, she will give time out. So I'm just saying, uh, <laughs> Rachel gets it right. Is here. Ruger Ridge is here. Sugar Bridges, the Scottish wild man, Tracy Gale and wonder woman. Great to see you guys. Thanks so much. All of you. Did someone else just pop in? Let me get back to the chat and have a look. Uh, I don't know. I think it's good. All right. Good. I think I got everybody that is chatting anyway. So great to see you guys. Thanks so much for being a part of the journey. So now we're getting into the rest of the meat and taters. That was how I grew up. Meat and taters. Mom made some meat and taters all the time. <laughs> So there's uh, a few things I want to go through. Uh, the first is uh, an article from Ranker.com that I dug up for you guys. And this is 18 unexplainable encounters that people swear actually happened. So here's the thing. Sometimes these, well, usually these are paranormal, but sometimes they're not. It's from their, uh, it's from their, uh, what, I guess it's kind of their paranormal section if they have one. It's, I think it's called the graveyard shift section that I found it in and uh, very interesting. I like ranker articles because they're, you know, a lot of those are, are farmed Reddit, uh, Reddit stories and stuff as well, but they're, they're very interesting. And this one was written by Alyssa Mariano. Let me pull up the screen. I got to close a couple things and you can see it right along with me. And there it is. And it's, it was written May 27th of 2022. So it's really pretty new. And uh, let's get into these. Some of these are long. Some of them are short, but all of them are usually interesting. So are you ready? Are you guys ready? Okay, here we go. The first one on the ranker list is I remember seeing a lady's face. And this is submitted by Redditor Papa Hunk. He says, when I was a kid, I remember seeing a lady's face in a doorway grinning at me with what I assumed to be something brown covering her entire face and teeth. Oh, that sounds horrid. I would see her several times until we moved away when I was five years old. Obviously, my family didn't see her, but my mom got worried when I told her what I saw, that I saw a lady from the kiosk, which is what I called the lady after I dreamt of her falling down a flight of stairs in a small store not far from our house. And I kid you not, my mom told me a few months ago that in that same store, I was dreaming of a woman. A woman had falled, uh, fallen down a flight of stairs and had her face torn on the way down. Oh, dear God. Apparently covered in dried blood when she was found. Hence my description of her. Imagine the look on my face when I heard that. Wow. You know, that's, that is kind of curious. So it wasn't actually at the location. And, and, and sometimes people have an assumption that uh, hauntings come from a history of something at an individual site. Like, oh, that house is old. There, there must have been people that passed away there, and that's why it's haunted. But uh, it can even just be in the area sometimes and for whatever reasons. And I, I don't know. I, what I wonder about is, is are there some instances where a, a person's soul is kind of attached to a place? And is that because maybe something traumatic happened there, something um, wonderful happened there, or any number of, of possibilities? But um, that certainly could be a, a case. But other times you get these stories where it, it didn't even happen at the location, 
but it happened in a nearby place. And why did then it come, the spirit of this woman come to this house and, and smile at this little kid all the time? And I don't know. And the other part is why does, why, why does she have to appear in such a horrid state? You know, and, and I guess the kid dealt with it okay because it was just a brown face to him. It was just a brown face. It wasn't, ooh, she, she had dried blood all over and was, you know, really disgusting. And I, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, why appear in the most fearful way? And maybe they don't know. Maybe they're just stuck in that moment in some sense. And uh, that's their identity is that last moment. Who knows? But anyway, cool story. Um, shocking, a little, little, quite tragic, but interesting enough. Uh, the next one, number two, I could see every wrinkle on her face. And this is by... Uranium Glass Cat from Reddit wrote, I just bought my first house. It's over 100 years old. While painting the one spare bedroom, I was on a ladder and was turned, and as I turned to climb down, there was a middle-aged lady dressed in a little house on the prairie style dress and bonnet directly at the base of the ladder looking at me. Well, it startled the hell out of me, and when I caught my wits again, she was gone. I could see every wrinkle on her face. She was looking at me with such huge eyes. No one believes me. Even my partner thinks I'm overreacting. We both hear things all the time, and he admits he hears the noises but refuses to acknowledge the existence of ghosts. Example, one evening we're both in the living room with our our cat, and that's, that's everything, everyone who lives in the house. Out of nowhere, we hear glass smashing in the kitchen directly beside us. It's an open concept kitchen. The cat even reacts to the noise. We go into the kitchen to see the mess, and there is no mess to be found. Nothing is out of place. This happens all the time, but whenever we, whenever we, wherever we are, it's in the next room. Also last night, I was standing against the wall, and I heard a male voice whisper my name into my right ear from behind the wall. My partner was asleep across the room. No one else in the house, and the TV was not on. So auditory phenomena like that I find really interesting, and the reason is is because there's lots of stories like that, lots of stories where it almost seems like an auditory hallucination, but is it potentially some residual event that plays, you know, because residual, residual events are just, these stored events that could be, they could be centered around a person could be centered around an event. It could be any number of things, but I've, I've covered so many stories on the show of people hearing exactly that hearing this, like, like every dish in their, in their kitchen just exploded out of the, out of the cupboards and smashing on the floor. They go in there and there's absolutely nothing out, out of place. And so what is that? Is that, you know, is that just some echo uh, of a past event? Is it just uh, spirits messing with people? Can they, can they induce audio hallucinations like that? There's also many stories of disembodied voices, much like he's talking about or she's talking about in this situation where um, there'll be a group of people and maybe only one or two of the group will hear it and everyone else won't. And why is that? And, you know, it's hard to say. But it is a, a very strange phenomenon that these, these voices and sounds can be impressed upon people when there's actually no physical event that is making them happen. And uh, sometimes just individual people. So it's very, very peculiar. But, uh, you know, make of it what you will, I guess. Number three, don't know what happened, but I got a nightlight after that. <laughs> Yeah, there's something about light, and maybe it's because we feel a lot less vulnerable because we can actually perceive our surroundings rather than being in absolute darkness where we're, we're fish out of water. So nightlights can add a lot of security to people's state of mind. But uh, it's from Redditor Midas underscore 1988. I mean, if you want to double down on similar situations, that's not even the, f- the first time something like that happened to me. I don't know, it's starting up like mid-story here. I was like eight-ish, living with my grandma, great-grandma, and my big sister, who was ten-ish. And it was bedtime, but obviously I was still awake. Now, my bedroom at the time was right across from the bathroom. 
Next door down from mine was my great-grandma's room, and across from her room was the master bedroom. Anyway, this particular night, I was awake and kind of waiting for my grandma to go to bed. My great-grandma comes down the hall, passes my room, and she continues to hers. I could tell it was her by her silhouette, as most of the lights were off in the house. I wish, wish her a good night. Moments later, I, ne- I see another similar silhouette cross my door, only this one stops in my doorway, turns towards me, approaches my bed, and starts reaching for me. I didn't know who it was, so I screamed bloody murder until both my grandma and great-grandma came running into my room to turn the light on. Don't know what happened to the silhouette, but I got a nightlight after that. <laughs> that's so that's so unbelievable. These poor kids that have these experiences like that. I mean, obviously, this is a this is a person that it happened when he was eight, and he's this, this person is still carrying that, you know. However, many years later, I and I don't pretend to know how old the person is now, but that's a that's an incredible event. Ugh. Anyway, let's go to number four, and this one. My brothers questioned me and thought I was lying. All right, and this is, well, I don't know who it's from. It says de- deleted, so whoever it was from must have deleted their Reddit account. But it says, I was playing hide-and-seek with my two brothers, and it was kind of dark, but not too dark. I saw my brother's heads pop out from a tree decently far away from me, and I started sprinting to them, and my brother's brothers both ran from behind a second tree about 40 feet away, meaning that it wasn't them behind the first tree. I ran my tail straight back to the house. My brothers questioned me and thought I was lying. It still scares me just thinking about it. Ooh, that's the kind of thing you got to wonder. Is that, is, could it be like a Sasquatch or Bigfoot or something like that? Could be. I don't know, or much maybe maybe not big Bigfoot, but just a, a, some, kind of, some kind of cryptid or... Is it spiritual? That's the tough part. I don't know. Good thing you were, the good thing everybody's okay. Number five, all my friends saw this happen, and this is by Linsanity16. Lin I threw a party at the condo I lived at, in with my sister and mom while we were we while they were on vacation when I was maybe 17. After the party died down, me and four of my close friends we're the only ones still there and awake. And while talking by the top of the basement stairs, the handle of the door at the top that was closed moved like someone was struggling to open it. Thinking somebody passed out in my basement and was too drunk to get the door open, I opened it to an empty basement. All my friends saw this happen, and we stayed up till morning in my living room, too freaked out to move. Everyone blows it off like we were just hammered, but by then we were nearly sobered up. Wow. Guess somebody was still there. It will never make sense to me. Number six. I guess number six, yeah. It will never make sense to me ever. This is by Dr. C.J. Henley. When I was little, maybe seven, the son of a lady who babysat my brother and I cut his leg on our swing set. Green goo came out of his leg. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember the type of of bolt it was. The cover was missing, so the cover was missing missing that would have prevented the cuts. I'm a dentist now, taking gross anatomy, dissecting a human body routinely in the OR for resections of crazy head and neck tumors. With the exception of gross infections, I've never seen green goo come out of someone let alone a healthy leg it will never make sense to me ever wow now here's the thing here's the rub do we know this is true no but if it is true and and it's up to you to decide i guess because i can't vouch for it either way it's it's supposed to be true but um if it is true could this be some form of of what may be extraterrestrials that are rumored to be living among us and look just like us. Could this have been an example of one of those? And, I mean, I'm sure that they can get cut too. And if they do, what does their blood look like? Would it be red like ours, or would it be perhaps a different color based on their physiology? And we don't know. 
But when I hear stories like that, it's like, well, that obviously isn't a human being if it's indeed true. So what are the options? Well, it's, it's probably not from here or at least not normal. Now, is it possible that there are segments of our society that just aren't, aren't human in the traditional sense? Maybe they look like us. Maybe they, they can fit in with us. But maybe they, they developed alongside of us in whatever their you know, secret little clique is. Um, is that possible? Maybe. Or, or something else. I don't know. I, I don't know what else it could be. So if it's not, if it's not extraterrestrial or some other version of, of life that looks exactly like us, then what are you left with? I don't know. Those are the ones that are really head scratchers for me. Now, again, you have to, you have to make a presumption that it's true, but in either, in any case, you know, the, the stories of, of, extraterrestrials living among us are, are plenty old. There's been stories like that forever of people from the stars being here. Hell, a lot of First Nations traditions have stories of interacting with people from the stars or that descended from the heavens or any number of variations, some from the earth, some came out of the earth, like the Hopi legends of the ant people that saved them from the deluge and, and so many other versions. So is it possible that we, we share the world not only with fellow human beings but and the natural kingdom that we know of and, and some that we don't, but is there other things, other things that look like us? And I don't mean things in a, in a derogatory sense, but is there just other forms of life that, that live among us? Maybe. I, I think that's pretty interesting, and, and that's the only thing I could attribute to somebody having green goo coming out of, the, out of their leg from a cut. That's, I don't have anything else. I don't know. You guys have to let me know what you think. Let me know in the comments if you're watching this after it's live or if you're in here, tell me in the, in the, in the chat room what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Number seven, I have no other memories from my early childhood. And this is from a Redditor named Lag, L-A-G-G-O-R, Lagger. Uh, I have very vivid memories of my great-grandfather. I distinctly remember which room he lay in for months while being cared for by his family, and what the layout of that room was like. I also have a memory of playing with him and him talking to me while I was fully aware that he had cancer in the la last latest stages and understood that he would probably die soon. Thing is, I, I only ever met him once in person, and I was only four months old. My family has pointed out that I knew facts about his appearance and that I could not possibly have known because there are close to no pictures of him, like a big scar he had across his chest from an operation. I have no other memories from early childhood. In fact, my memory about that time is so bad, I don't even correctly recall things from my time in kindergarten. Wow, that's wild. So, S. Morga says, is uh, Paranormal Portals being live-streamed? in the world's oldest surviving rainforest forest in far north Queensland, Australia. Oh, very cool, S. Morga. Morga. Very nice. Glad I'm there. I hope you guys are enjoying it. <laughs> that's outstanding. Um, yeah, that's, that's very strange. So a story like this, is this one of those situations where there's, there's a soul family? Some people have, a, have an idea that the families that we're in in life our soul families for us, that perhaps we choose to be incarnated with these same other, other souls or, or lights or spirits or, or you know, whatever. We're, we choose to incarnate over and over with these people because we're on a similar journey. We love them. They're, you know, they're familiar to us and, and so on and so forth. So is this a situation? There are stories of people meeting uh, ghostly uh, apparitions that turn out to look exactly like children that they're going to have. And is this, is this one of those situations? This person being on death's door, being in that hospice situation in their own home, is, is it possible that by being so close to death, he was able to perceive the soul of this child that would be coming into the world or, or what? I don't know. Or is there something else going on? I just, I, I wonder. Because he did, this person did meet the the the, the grandfather, um, great grandfather rather, when he was four months old, but you know I don't know, very strange. 
That's a cool story, though. Number eight. A oh boy, that was a mistake. This is by Kaido786. Was playing with my cousin and a friend of ours outside. We were riding our bikes and had a bunch of fun. But couldn't explore that far from where I live since we're only like seven or eight years old. As we were cheerfully cycling down a long road behind our parking garage near my apartment, I started to slow down as I was getting tired of it. Both of them were continuing to cycle down the road as they hadn't noticed me being left behind yet. You have to understand the, that the location of that road was right in between the parking garage with two floors and a fence, which only has rails uh, on the other side and us is, was usually deserted. So I stopped cycling. I could only turn tail or follow the road ahead. As After reaching my limit, I simply stopped my bike midway after a while and tried to catch some breath. While doing so, something caught my eye on the back stairs of that parking garage. I tried to get closer to check out what it was uh, out of curiosity, but boy, was that a mistake. I spotted a man who seemed to kneel down behind a wall of the back stairs. Didn't seem suspicious at first. However, after a closer look, I saw what seemed like a knife covered in blood. My body froze and all I could feel was fear that went through my body, which felt like it lasted for minutes. The man just started to catch to catch on with me. The man just started to catch on with me standing on the road and began to slowly stand up and face my direction. I was somehow able to get my brain back to process and bolted down the street with any power I had left in me. After passing both my cousin and friend, as well as leaving a big distance to where I spotted him, I started to break down in tears and explain what happened. No one would believe me since they went back and check and found nothing strange. I got so traumatized from it that I avoided the road until my mid-teens. Too loud. Uh, saw a man with a knife covered in blood behind a parking garage while cycling as a kid, and no one would believe it. Yeah. Too long to download or read. Well, it wasn't too long. I don't know. Is that an apparition then of something that happened in the past? Probably. Very, very, very sick. <laughs> That'd be hard as a kid. Be hard to see that kind of stuff as a kid. Okay, we got about three minutes left, so we'll cover one or two more of these. I was walking home behind my school at night. This is from Redditor ilits for you 0 I don't know. I don't know. That must mean something. <laughs> I was walking home behind my high school at night. In the teacher's break room, I saw a cleaning lady pushing a cart. She went into the floor like she and the cart got into an escalator and went down. This is in the teacher's break room. There are no escalators or ramps in there. I could understand her slowly descending for some weird reason, but not the cart. Those things are solid. She was glitched uh, NPC. It's too expensive to fill the world with unique players. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. There's a theory that <clears throat> perhaps all of the people in the world, only a percentage of them are, are quote-unquote organic consciousness. And perhaps the rest of them are, are a term used in video games called NPC, non-player characters. They're just characters that are there, but they're not being controlled by anyone. They just have a specific purpose. And is it possible that our world is filled with some of those kind of people? Well, if this is just a simulation, I guess it makes sense. Um, or some other representation. But I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I, I think it's possible. I really do. I think I've met some of those NPC type people. Uh, yeah, yeah, you might be an NPC. You might not, though. <clears throat> I don't know w what what to think about ideas like that because is there... I don't know. There's a lot of people in the world. Is it possible there's so many billions of souls? I, I think I think it's possible. But I just think that we're all on different parts of the journey. Like some people are, are really working on w tuning into a real higher vibration and others are just working on the basic stuff like uh, how to live a good life or how not to, how not to go on, uh, you know, uh, drug bins and stuff like that or benders and and wreck their life. You know, some people are in different parts of the journey. So, but is it possible? Maybe, I don't know. It's anybody's guess, but it's an, it's a, it's an interesting idea, but you be the judge. I don't know. 
That's too big a picture for me to address. I think it's interesting, though. So <clears throat> I'll tell you what, we're going to be going to our break, and uh, we're going to get back to all of this fun and more when we come back. In the second hour, we're going to get into the creature reports uh, from both phantoms and monsters and from uh, from uh, Sasquatch Chronicles. Sorry, <laughs> I just drew a did my matrix glitched right up here so we'll be right back don't go away lots more to come i see there's a call we'll get to the call when we come back from break so just hang on the hang on the phone caller we'll be right with you brother
Caroline is not like those she's with. They're attracted to the one thing about her that is different from themselves. Her life force is very strong. It gives off its own illumination. It is a light that complies to life and memory of love and home and earthly pleasures. Something they desperately desire but can't have anymore. Right now, she's the closest thing to that. Poltergeist are usually associated with an individual. Hauntings seem to be connected with an area. A house, usually. The guy's disturbances are of fairly short duration, perhaps a couple of months. Hauntings can go on for years. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're into hour number two here on the show, and uh, God, it's just blowing by. It's crazy fast. Uh, kind of miss having Sheldon here. Uh, obviously, he would normally be here with me on s Saturday nights, but he's got some kind of job he's cooking, so uh, he's he's unfortunately not able to be here. Uh, he'll he'll come in whenever he's available, but uh, it's kind of tough when uh, you're on the clock. He's got some weird hours and stuff, so. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to drop this out, and please don't think this is a this is a self plug or anything. But I, I get comments like this often, and I just wanted to let you guys know. Um, the music you hear on the Paranormal Portal is is my music. I, I did write it, and I appreciate all the kind words. And I've gotten some <laughs> I've gotten some less than kind words too, which is fine. I I don't ever I, you know no one kind of music gonna appeal to everybody. And the fact that anybody likes my music is just a you know it's just a real thrill. Again, I I never played my music on the show because I was trying to flex or you know promote myself. The only reason I actually started was because. Uh, you know, you get in trouble if you play other people's music, and I and I didn't want to deal with that, so I just thought, well, I know I can play my music. Now, ever since doing that on the show, I got comments all the time like, oh, you should make that available. You should let, you know, let people download it. So I'm just going to do this uh, now. I, I don't usually do this on the show. There is a link in the description, but uh, this is this is my band camp where I have a few songs available um, that you'll hear during the shows. Uh, so... If you want to check it out, that's really cool. They are available for download. If you want to, do, well, you want to do that, you, you certainly can. Um, and there, you can listen to them on there as well, along with the the lyrics, so you can you know check it out. Do with it what you will, um, but it is available. And again, that's brentthomas.bandcamp.com. The link is in the YouTube description. Um, you know. That. I'm just throwing it out there. Again, this isn't self-promotion, but rather than me continuing to type it, uh, I can tell a bunch of you right now uh, that this is where you can find it. So if you're interested, that's where you can find the music that I wrote and sang and tried to perform. So, <laughs> And I'm not, uh, you know, flexing. Again, I'm, I'm not a musician. Some people, oh, you're a musician. No, I'm not. I'm really a scrub. I am an absolutely a musical scrub, but... I was able to just, you know, put some ideas down and, and find some melodies that felt right. And so that's, you know, I don't ever consider myself a musician. Musicians are people that really know their instrument. They're very proficient at it. And I'm not proficient at any of them. I just like to play. It's actually very, very cathartic and, and uh, therapeutic for me to do music because, you know, that's just where a lot of my emotion goes, you know, instead of, uh, blowing out in some uh, behavioral way. I just do it through music. So some of it's happy, some of it's angry, some of it's kind of, you know, reflective. So there's I th three songs I think are currently available there. And if I can get good recordings of other ones, I'll, I'll post them up as well if you're interested. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's where you can find it. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get my, my screens up here so we can continue the journey. I'm going to cover a couple more from this uh, ranker list. And uh, then we're going to jump into some of these reports from uh, Phantoms and Monsters. And there's a, a good-sized one from Sasquatch Chronicles that a listener of Sasquatch Chronicles submitted. So 
we'll uh, go through those. So, <laughs> like Cliff Poncier from Singles, all this negativity just makes me stronger. <laughs> that's clever. I, I haven't heard that music, but uh, that sounds wonderful. All right, so we're going to get into another one here uh, from the Ranker article that we've been covering. And this is, uh, again, the article is uh, uh, Unexplainable Unsolved Encounters. And uh, it's a really pretty good compilation. I've loved these stories that, that have been covered on here. And these are, this is, ag- Ranker does a lot of aggregates, uh, Reddit aggregates. So basically they go out under Reddit threads and, and farm comments and stuff. So that's what we're covering tonight. And we're on number 10. So let me cough quick. All right, so here we go. We're on number 10, I Was Mortified. And so this is by (laughs) she Ra, she underscore Ra, R-A-A underscore. I was 10 and in the car with my mom. I looked out the window, passenger side, and the lady next to us looked back at me. Her face was distorted. I was mortified. I turned to my mom to tell her, and when we both looked, The lady was just smiling. I remember her so clearly, her little blue car. So distorted, how? Like it was, was it distorted when she was smiling too? That I I don't know. (laughs) Or did it it correct and then she was just smiling? Like, hey, I'm normal. Uh, I don't know. That's a strange one. What was that? Uh, Maggie typed something, but it disappeared. Brent, is the caller still there? No, the caller hung up on us, so... Maybe the caller will call back in, but uh, who, who it was uh, a listener. Uh, I recognize the name, but he, but he hung up, so we'll have to wait and uh, see if he'll call back in, I guess. There was a phone call, but it, as soon as we went to break, it uh, hung up. But thank you guys for keeping me on track. <laughs> this is why I need a co-host, believe me. <laughs> yeah, it hung up right as soon as we went to break. So, But maybe, maybe he'll call back in. All right, the next one is number 11, The Thing Froze 2. This is by traditional underscore self underscore 658. I'm going to share something my grandma told me that she saw because it is so freaking weird, and I have never heard anything like this before in my life. My grandma and her cousin were walking on a country road in Oklahoma sometime in the 1940s they saw a strange figure float up over a hill up ahead, about a football field away, and she said it appeared two-dimensional, that it was roughly the size of a cow. It was white and was composed of geometric shapes. It had a rectangular body with no legs. It floated. It had a square head at one end and two little triangle ears and a little slit-looking eyes. No nose or mouth that she could see. When the figure rose up over the hill, my grandmother and her cousin froze in terror. The thing froze too. They all just stood there staring at each other for a moment. Then its head floated to the opposite end of its body, and it floated back in the direction it came from. Her cousin corroborates her story, but it's just very strange to me. I believe that they saw something weird, but I'm not sure. I'm convinced that a weird two-dimensional demon cow is out there floating around in Oklahoma somewhere. <laughs> you know, that's a that's interesting. Okay, so we oftentimes hear mentions of dimensions, higher dimensions, lower dimensions. There's that sounds to me more like a vibrational thing or frequency, but uh, you know, there's the we're in the third dimension generally with our uh, awake experiences, but is there a second dimensional beings and creatures that might pop into our uh, our existence that would just only have length and width but no depth is that possible that much like pterodactyls appear in the skies that i i i I guess i can only think that they must come trans-dimensionally somehow but is it possible that other things kind of float in from other dimensions from time to time and is there two-dimensional uh life forms is that possible i don't know because it would have to be infinite tests infinitely uh, um, flat to be actually two-dimensional. There can only be length and width. There could be no depth. So, I, and I don't know. I mean, is there, it, it sounds like, you know, having a bit of Minecraft pop into our world, but like 
maybe more like Atari first generation kind of graphics. I don't know. It's very strange, but is there something to it? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure these people saw what they saw, but I don't know what that stuff means. And that's the curiosity. The other thing that was occurring to me is I, 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 one of the things that I think it might be perhaps one of the greatest tragedies of all is things being lost to time stories that people had knowledge the experiences that they had that are just lost like if they don't share it with anybody and i think about that all the time because i really think everybody has some stories they've had some experiences that they can't complain or can't explain people complain all the time but they can't explain them and and if they don't share them those things are lost that experience is lost and and serves to help nobody because it's an individual experience. And I do understand people's reluctance to share things because to share an experience like that, you are, you're exposing a part of yourself. I mean, that you had a weird experience, probably that most of us haven't come to terms with. I'm not sure I've come to terms with all my experiences, but uh, you know, but I, I do share them because I think it serves to help, you know, especially doing a show that look, I'm not just asking you for your stories. I have a bunch myself and that that's why I'm on this journey is because I want to understand better what I experienced and maybe I can learn from yours. But think of all the generations of people that have had bizarre, fantastical experiences that they just chose never to share and then they're lost. I don't know why, but it, it, I mean, it literally makes me feel a great swell of sadness that those experiences are just lost. And, and that's one of the reasons why I take it as a, as a truly a sacred trust when people share their experiences with me. I can't always understand people's experiences, but I, I do believe that these are people's experiences. This is something they have experienced. And I find it incredibly, incredibly flattering and, and, and important that they choose to share them with me. So that's why I'm always interested to hear people's stories. Okay, Brent, howdy. Expect a Facebook request. Thank you, C.S. Morga. I appreciate that, brother. Uh, or sister, I don't know if you're male or female. My apologies, I don't mean to assume, but uh, yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you, um, and I hope you've subscribed here on on YouTube as well. So that's interesting. I, I think that's really incredible. So let's go to number twelve. I realize she is not coming out the door. This is from redditor uh, b u c c a r u e. What is that? Bucharu or Bukaru or something? I don't know. When I was in college, I was walking back to my friend's room from the kitchen. It was a dorm, so if you can, imagine a kitchen facing a stairwell to the outside, and to your left and right are doors with windows that lead to other wings of the building, all of which have dorms lining them. I turn to head back down the hallway, and I see my friend walking towards me through the window. I see she doesn't notice me, so I hide by the door so I can spook her. I wait a few moments before I realize she's not coming out the door. I walk down to the room and I ask her why she was in the hallway. There were like three other people in that room all looking very confused. She was in here the entire time. So, yeah, I don't know what's up with that. Oh, that's interesting. So could that be uh, some kind of a time slip? that uh, the person observing it saw a, a slipped version of time for a moment there? Uh, maybe. Could it be a, a doppelganger? Maybe. That's the curiosity of all this stuff because there's so many possibilities. But uh, I think time slip stuffs are, stuff is really interesting. Um, it's, it, or something residual maybe. Could it be a residual event? Maybe there was a time when that person, that student was walking down the hallway just all... all stressed out about something and projected this 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 memory onto the surroundings and then it replays because that's what a residual haunting is uh the residual hauntings are not intelligent they're not actually a a, a spirit that's appearing there it's just some memory and uh the stone tape theory is what that's based on which is a parapsychology theory so it's interesting <clears throat> number 13 one of my dad's friends passed out drunk in a kayak. <laughs> okay, I don't know. This doesn't sound real paranormal. I can relate to this. I had a few benders when I was younger. <clears throat> this is by Mustang WWII. 
Not me, but one of my dad's friends passed out drunk in a kayak while fishing in Tennessee. He woke up at some point later, having drifted pretty far down the river. He woke up, he saw a giraffe eating from a tree above him, and was rightfully real freaking confused. Of course, everyone thought he he must have been a little more on must have been on a little more than alcohol, and he was telling us what he saw the next day. <laughs> it turns out there's a wildlife rehabilitation center along the river. He was fishing and had apparently taken some giraffes from a zoo somewhere. Hearing this giant 60-year-old tell the story with a country accent made it far, far, much, much funnier. Yeah. <laughs> so not really paranormal in that case, but that's... <laughs> I, what would you think? You fell asleep, you're drunk, you fall asleep in a kayak and you wake up and there, you see giraffes? Oh, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'd have been launching some brown sharks at that point. That's not what you expect to see at all. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, still no calls. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk to the caller. Call, by the time I noticed it, we had to go to break. So, unfortunately, that's the way it rolls sometimes. But I'll do try to do better keeping an eye on that. I slammed on the brakes and veered into the next lane. Is the next story? <clears throat> God, maybe I should. Maybe well, we'll read this one and then go on. From redditor Dad's R G R eight. Shortly after my wife and I were first married, we were making a, the Easter Sunday. Both families want you for dinner, drive circuit. I was driving from my parents' house to her parents' house, and she had her eyes closed. Suddenly, a peacock ran out from the woods and across the road in front of the car. I slammed on the brakes and veered into the next lane. My wife yelled, what the hell? And I said, I almost hit a freaking peacock. I'd never seen a peacock in the wild before, but she didn't believe me. 36 years later, and I still haven't lived that down, and she occasionally reminds me to watch out for peacocks when we're out in the car. Now, a lot of people have domesticated peacocks or, or they own them as, as pets or whatever, and so I don't think that's beyond the scope of possibility that there is a peacock, and it just was uh, happened to get away from whoever owned it in that area. But, yeah, that's not a common thing, but people do own them as pets or, or have historically anyway, so... It's not unusual, and not that unusual, actually, that it, and, and that I certainly would probably think much less paranormal and much more just, hey, somebody has an exotic pet that got away. But to each his own. All right, let's get to, uh, let's get to a report from Phantoms and Monsters. Again, this is uh, Lon Strickler's site, Phantoms and Monsters. It's a great site, great uh, encounter stories on there. They also do paranormal research and 40 and research into cryptids. Dogman, Bigfoots, uh, strange phenomena, the Mothman up in the uh, Chicago Great Lakes area that are being investigated by, by uh, Phantoms and Monsters team up there. So there's lots of things going on, and they also have a phenomenal uh, um, podcast. It's called Phantoms and Monsters Radio. So head over to phantomsandmonsters.com and check it out. Lots of great information over there. Literally thousands of stories uh, of, of su uh, supernatural, cryptid, and Fortean topics. So really good. This one is rancid smelling Bigfoot terrifies camper in New Jersey Pine Barrens. I've had a, a couple of people on. Both Eric Mintel Investigates crew was on along with uh, along with uh, Eric er, uh, Eric. Oh my God! I can't believe I'm going to mess up his name uh, again. But uh, he he has the the show Squatch Talks, and uh, they he does investigating in the Pine Barrens, and I, I can't believe that name slipped my mind, but. I have a true dyslexia for names, so my apologies. But let's get into this and see what's going on. A New Jersey man is forced to camp in the Pine Barrens for several nights. On the last night, he has a terrifying encounter with a rancid-smelling Bigfoot that insists on exploring his campsite. Oh, man. I don't know what it is about that smell, man, but I've never smelled it, but it's got to be about the worst smell on the face of the world. I guess it's just rancid. Uh, on November 28th of 2014, my life sort of fell apart all at once. In a manner of, a, of a one day, I lost my job, my business, my company car, and my place to live for reasons that I won't go into detail about here. Let's just say that I was screwed over by my business partner, and that's that. At the time, I had just enough money to either buy a junker vehicle or put down a security deposit and first month's rent on an apartment. I'm a rather resourceful guy, and I opted for the vehicle. 
I figured a car was better, uh, a better move as I could live in it for as long as it took to get my life together and it would give me more options for finding a new job. I'd lost everything, but I had two things, a full set of camping gear and a girlfriend who still loved me. So I figured I could rough it outside in the cold winter nights until I found a new job or new car and a job. At the time, I'd been living in a town that was located on the edge of the Pine Barrens Wilderness uh, of southern New Jersey. For those that have never heard of it, the Pine Barrens is a rather unique one million acre forest of mostly pine trees that has lots of deer, turkey, coyotes, and some unique prehistoric type plants that only grow in that area. My girlfriend at the time lived with her parents, and despite the fact that they barely knew me, she had convinced them to t take me in. But I was uncomfortable with that idea and refused the offer. As you can imagine, my girlfriend was beside herself with worry because she knew I was too proud and just accepted my crazy decision to live outdoors in the wintertime. I chose a spot on the edge of the neighborhood that I, I had been previously living in, near a dirt storage clearing, a dirt storage clearing, that was being used to dump and store dirt to build new developments of homes. I found a large path into the woods and made a stealth camp only about a quarter mile deep in the Pine Barrens. I would sleep in the woods at night and in the morning I would make the short walk into civilization where my woman would pick me up. Once she came to get me, I would use her car to drive her to work and then spend the day looking for a vehicle and a new job. I would also take an hour or so to head to the gym to work out and get a shower each day. Around 5 p.m., I would pick her up at work, and she would drop me off back near my campsite. Wednesday, December 3rd, uh, was to be my fifth and final night in that particular patch of woods. By then, I'd found a job that I was to start in a few weeks and had purchased an old SUV, and it was still at the used car lot as my new car insurance would not be active until the following day. My new job didn't start for a month, but I had already paid for a real campsite far away in another area of the Pine Barrens that I could live in until then. This way I could have big fires, ride my mountain bike through the trails, and not have to sneak in and out e uh, each morning and evening. So December 3rd, 2014 was my last night at the stealth camp on the edge of town. To this day, I enjoy winter camping, and even then I'd done so many times in my life. So I had a routine setup. I used to camp in cold weather. I always encapsulated my tent with a large heavy-duty camo tarp. This keeps the weather out very effectively, and it also helps to trap a little heat for comfort, but unfortunately makes it so you cannot see outside without lifting the tarp uh, at your tent entrance to look around. By 8 p.m. or so, I had finished eating. It was relaxing, just puffing on my vape and feeling happy that I would be in a much more comfortable situation the next day. Just like that, uh, every other day at this camp, at this location, at this time of night, a pack of coyotes was right outside my tent making a ruckus. The first two nights, I was sort of shocked, but by this time, I was used to it, uh, them, and was sure they didn't dare attack a full-grown human. But I still slept with a 26-inch, very sharp, full-tang sword at my side each night just in case. I was lying on my back in the tent starting to doze off to the sound of the coyote pack when they all started yipping and suddenly ran off into the deep woods together. During the previous nights, they would slowly leave the area as a group, continued to scrap uh, and circle the general area. So this sudden departure sort of piqued my interest, and I opened my eyes to listen. It was dead silent. After a minute or two, I started getting, used to, uh, getting ready to doze off again when a powerful and unpleasant stench filled my tent, and I can't begin to explain how overwhelming and terrible the stench was. I sat up in my tent and stuck my face inside my coat to escape it. It was no use. There was no escaping the smell. It was a combination of extremely bad body odor mixed with skunk and feces. I was too overwhelmed by the odor, odor to even ponder what was making it. It was strong enough to make me feel sick, and I remember at one point trying to avoid the smell by breathing through my mouth, and the odor was so strong that I could taste it on the tip of my tongue. Ugh. I was at the point of holding my breath, that, and whatever it was that was stinking up my campsite needed to go the hell away, so I decided to go outside my tent and run whatever it was off. I don't think I can finish it before the break, so we're going to pause that story right there because in literally 30 seconds I'm going to have to go to break, so I don't want to run into the break reading it. So this is a, a, 
the body order thing is is real common. Uh, again, I think it's I think it's some kind of defense mechanism. Uh, maybe they emit from specific glands that uh, is a stress reaction. Whenever they're stressed, uh, maybe it's a, a deterrence, much like a skunk. I don't know because many people have encounters with no smell at all. But some of these pro close proximity sightings do include this horrid stench. And perhaps that's just to keep people away. I mean, it's, it sounds like it works because everyone that smells it, it literally many times gets the gag reflex. Like they just want to empty their stomachs. It's so horrible. So I guess if, if you're a... If you're, you're trying to keep people away, a bad smell is a good way to start. So we'll be right back, back for the last half hour of the show. Don't go away. There's more to come. We'll finish this story and get into the Sasquatch Chronicles one as well. So we'll be right back.
right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. And this is the home stretch. Can you believe it? It's been almost two hours. One and a half hours is behind us. What the heck is going on here, huh? It's a time anomaly. It must be. It's magic. It's just like magic. But anyway, we're in the middle of a story here. And there's been a great discussion in the chat uh, on YouTube about what is this? What is the smell? And, and there's been several theories. I, I tend to think it's more glandular because it doesn't seem to be consistent. But it's also popped up out of nowhere when they're close. Like when people get too close, suddenly this horrible stench hits them that wasn't present before. So it does seem to be something that, at least anecdotally, that they can, they can control and emit when they need to. Um, but there's ideas like, hey, they're eating gut piles. That'll make you stink. stink. Uh, perhaps they're eating skunks, and, and that's where the smell comes from. And certainly people often refer to the skunky part of it, um, and that may just be because it's the only other natural, uh, natural equivalent of a strong, pungent-smelling creature. And so perhaps there's, there's, there's that, or perhaps from being in swamps was also suggested that uh, swamp mud can be n pretty noxious stuff itself. So it's all potentially possible, but I, I do believe that given the, given the nature of how people uh, encounter it, Many times they'll hear something around the camp circling around and stuff, and, and when they get close enough to investigate, suddenly they're hit with this wall of smell. And many people have talked about how they just start puking or dry heaving or, or whatever because it's so powerful. So in order for a smell to hit you that powerfully, it's, you know, it's got to be reasonably close. But if it, was, if it was always there, I would think people would most often probably catch a bit of it as they were closing in on it but it seems to just come out of nowhere like pow and so i don't know but it's all theories folks no there is no wrong answers as as wes always tells us so and he's right i really i really agree with that but we're in this story the guy is in the pine barrens camp and he's just getting his life together got a job that'll start in a month and he's just about to move from the stealth camping area an area that he's camping uh, tucked back uh, off the road about a half mile into the Pine Barrens. He's now going to be moving to a campground, but he's in his, in his tent. He, he had the coyotes come, and suddenly they left in a hustle in a big hurry, and he's suddenly filled, with, the tent is just suddenly filled with this noxious, uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that word right, noxious, I think so. Uh, scent that that he can't get away from, even putting his hand in his coat. So he's decided to run out and chase whatever it is off because he can't deal with it, and it's, you know, freaking him out. He said the woods were also very quiet. So uh, I unsheathed my sword and started to unzip the tent entrance when I hear someone walking down the path in the woods that was located behind my camp. I say someone instead of something because it was clearly a person walking on two feet. I slowly unzipped the, te zipped the tent back up and went silent. The path was pretty well traveled during the day by the locals, walking their dogs and by neighborhood kids, but this was the first time at night that I had heard anyone using the path. Whoever it was was big and heavy because I could actually hear the thud of their feet impacting the dirt path which with each step. I'd made my stealth camp pretty close to the path for ease of use, but I'd camouflaged it so well behind the earth and earth mound with brush and a camp camo tarp that, that one could walk within a few yards of it and not see it. The footsteps stopped, and then I heard the unmistakable sound of whoever it was leave the dirt path and slowly walk into the woods behind me to my left. My heart sank, and adrenaline filled my bloodstream. I'd made it for four nights undetected, and on my last night, I was about to be found out. I'm pretty sure I was on some kind of private property, and with all the crap going on in my life at the time, the last thing I needed was for the cops to arrest me and break, break up my camp. Like I said, my camp was well hidden, and it showed no signs of anyone being there while I was gone, so I was wondering why this person was heading towards me. The whole time, the stench was just as strong as ever, but had taken backstage in my mind to the current new situation at hand. I could hear whoever it was carefully and slowly walking closer and closer until they were maybe 20 feet off to my left. They sounded like the footsteps of someone trying to sneak up on something or someone else. They stopped at my left side for a moment and then 
started to walk at a normal noisy pace through the leaves until they were about 15 or 20 yards from my tent in the area where the coyotes would congregate each night. Then they stopped. I could hear deep, hoarse breathing, like a giant monster catching its breath. I was paralyzed with fear and my heart was pounding out of my chest. Then it walked right up to the front of the tent. I clutched my blade and held my breath. Next, whatever it was, walked very slowly around to the right side of my tent, still breathing deep and heavy. Then it leaned itself right up to the wall of my tent and started to sniff loudly. It took long, deep sniffing noises through its nose and would exhale through its mouth. I was terrified, as its face was just feet away from me. At this point, I was growing confused. The only logical thing I could think was that there was a bear, that a bear was right outside of my tent. But the thing is that bears are almost non-existent in the Pine Barrens, especially so close to a busy construction site. But I thought to myself, what else could it be? Nothing was making sense. I was sure I had, the, I had heard a person on two feet walking this whole time, but no human, no matter how dirty and homeless, could smell that powerfully. Plus the breathing I was hearing sounded more like a giant monster than a human. But monsters aren't real, right? So I rationalized that it had to be a bear. At this point I had to do something. I figured I would say something out loud if this was a giant smelly person I could probably get a response, and if it was indeed a bear, there was a 99.99% chance it would run for its life once it realized there was a human in the tent. One thing I knew was that black bears are terrified of humans. So I took a deep breath and said loudly and sharp, Who's there? And then I whacked the side of the tent it was standing at with a hard and quick backhand. The thing took two steps back, and to my absolute horror... It let out the deepest, most terrifying growl I have ever heard. Oh, man, I know that sound. I can hear it just from my memories. Ugh. It, it is the one sound that uh, literally, I, I mean, I thought I was dying. I thought I was going to die when I heard that. Um, so uh, it's a, at this point, my heart stopped and I almost soiled my pants. It was a long and very deep growl, just like a dog's, but it sounded like a dog that would have to weigh about 800 pounds. I sat there with my blade poised in shock, terrified, and waited for whatever it was to rip through the tarp and kill me on the spot. At what was probably a 5 to 10 second growl, then it went silent and all I heard was the deafening noise of my pulse pounding in my head. Then sounded to my surprise, it walked away into the forest. I could hear the sound of a creature on two legs crushing the dried leaves and twigs underfoot as it walked away. I stayed perfectly still, holding my breath until I could not hear it walking any more. Then I took a deep breath and almost collapsed with relief in the tent. The horrible stench began to get less and less until it finally went away. I was feeling relieved and my heart was starting to finally calm down when suddenly I heard the sound of what I could only be a large tree branch being snapped quickly from a tree or snapped in half followed by it being smashed into a tree or other piece of wood. Right after that it made a noise that sounded like a single very loud dog bark followed by what I can only describe as the sound of a woman screaming. My heart jumped to full turbo mode once again and I broke out into a cold sweat. After that, I heard nothing else, and it took a good 20 minutes for me to calm down. When the adrenaline finally subsided, I was overwhelmed with exhaustion. I reasoned that if it wanted to do me harm, it would have, and at this point, it was safe to fall asleep. Interestingly, I had one of the best night's sleep I have ever had. In the morning, I packed everything up and got out of there, when my girlfriend picked me up that morning, she took me one look at me and asked me why I have looked so disturbed. I told her what happened, and she said it must have been one of the coyotes that I was being dramatic. To this day, the only people who believe me are my brother and my 13-year-old son. I'd always told myself it was a bear. I couldn't come up with any other logical conclusion, 
But like I said, black bears are all but non-existent in the Pine Barrens. Also, since then, I have done the research and learned that bears do not have a strong order at all, even during mating season or while hibernating. The thought of it being a Sasquatch never even crossed my mind at the time because I thought they only existed in the northwestern United States and Canada. That is, if they existed at all. Besides, what would a mythical creature like that be doing hanging out next to a fully, fairly populated New Jersey town like that? Since then, I've educated myself on Bigfoot, and now I'm pretty sure it was a Sasquatch that scared the crap out of me that night. I suppose I will never really know. My life is now perfect, and it's hard to believe that just over five years ago, I was a homeless in the woods of New Jersey. I still like to winter camping, though, camping alone almost every year. But now that, now that I know that the monsters are real, I'll only go to wilderness areas where I'm allowed to carry a big bore revolver. 30 out 6 rifle or a 12 gauge with slugs. <laughs> That's an incredible story. Wow. That guy's uh, I you know, I don't know. I know that growl though. That's that's a horrible feeling. Even to just hear him talk about it just brought it back in my head. It's like, oh, the the absolute panic that I felt when that and the any I guess he ex, he described it very well. It's it's similar to a dog's growl if the dog was like eight or nine hundred pounds. It's just such a deep growl. Oh, wow! Very cool story. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And a uh, special thanks again goes to Lon Strickler for letting us talk about that on the show. That's really, really incredible. God, I never even brought you guys over to the side. I never even put it on the screen for you, did I? <laughs> Sorry. Well. My apologies. You got to look at me in full screen for that whole time. Hope that's okay. Uh, let's close that one. Uh, with the 13 minutes left, I want to get to the Sasquatch Chronicles story that I was talking about before as well. And, uh, of course, Sasquatch Chronicles is, is Wes Germer's site. A wonderful guy. And uh, he and I have become great friends over the last few years. It's just been a real uh, pleasure to get to know Wes and uh, – he said, yeah, use whatever you want. So <laughs> I'm taking him up on that. And uh, here we go. And if you, you know, I know a lot of you, and I, I like to put this out there because I don't think everybody knows that Sasquatch Chronicles is also a great site for reports, for uh, people telling their stories. And Wes constantly is linking other shows and, and uh, other material on there. So it's a great reference as well. You don't even have to be a member, but you can certainly go use the site and check out what people are posting and what he's posting for you to check out. So it's a great resource for anybody interested in learning more about all this, all this strange stuff. And essentially, not only Sasquatch. So, you know, even though it's called Sasquatch Chronicles, Wes really does cover a lot of, a lot of various topics. So this is uh, from May 17th, and uh, the story is... Uh, a tall, slender, athletic build black figure. And it says, a listener writes, on May 8th, 2021, on the, on the Liberty Reservoir in Carroll County, Maryland, at approximately 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I had the following experience fishing. I was in a U-shaped cove fishing on the north side. Another fisherman recently passed by me from the south side and said hi. I said hi to him as he passed by, and about five minutes after... The fisherman passed. I started to hear rustling in the brush on the other side, south of my co of the cove, about 70 to 100 yards from where I was fishing. I looked in that general area and noticed a pair of black legs. However, the full figure of the person or object was not visible as the top portion of the figure was covered by tree branches. Noises in these woods do not alarm me because I've fished in and mountain biked in this reservoir area close to a thousand times. A few minutes later, I heard what sounded like a log get tossed into the water in the south side of the cove. I'm familiar with the sound of a beaver diving from the shore, and this is what it sounded like. But you usually see the beaver's head pop up after the noise, and I had no such sighting. When this happened, I, I looked, uh, looked for the pair of black legs and saw they were still visible. At this point, I was thinking that the black legs were either tree legs, uh, tree legs, <laughs> or a fisherman just standing there tackling, tackling his rod. 
Either way, I was starting to get a strange vibe from what was happening on the south side. Still fishing, I ended up getting my line caught on a tree slash big branch submerged in the water. Still feeling somewhat uh, something being off with the activity on the opposite side of me in the cove, I intentionally got loud with frustration using and cursing with my stuck line to, I guess, intimidate uh, the activity across from me. So I started tugging and pulling my line for a few minutes to get it loose. As I'm tugging, I see a tall, slender, athletic build, black figure about seven feet high, moving in, uh, moving in an open area. This figure was black head to toe, moving in an upright position on its two feet in almost an animal-like gait, walking back and forth in a four-yard four width space, looking right at me. I could not get a clear visual on the figure face and it did it did give out it did I think it did not is what he meant to say didn't give out any audible noises that I could hear. The figure then picked up a dead tree or dead tree branch which was about 10 feet in length and about 6 to 8 inches in diameter and threw it into the water. You never know how you how you react in these instances until they occur to you. I could not believe what I was seeing thought about reaching for my phone, but honestly was sort of afraid to photo or video it. I immediately cut my fish line and started walking away from the figure. I called my wife in a panic and she just asked me to leave the area ASAP. As I was leaving, I saw a young lady in her 20s walking her dog off leash. I told her, I typically do not believe in these things, but I think I just saw a Sasquatch. She discounted my reference and said that it was probably probably a bear. I immediately rebuffed that I what I saw had a seven foot tall slender build and tossed a ten foot branch into the water. I think she saw the look on my face and that I was not joking, so she leashed her dog and turned the other way and proceeded to leave the direction she came in. After I saw this young lady, I encountered the fisherman that I had passed me maybe fifteen minutes before who passed through the South Cove area where I had been sighting, where I had the sighting. I asked him if he saw or heard any suspicious activity before he passed by me, and he said no. I told him that I just thought I saw a Bigfoot, and he said he didn't believe in that stuff, and I asked him how long he was planning on staying in this area, and he said probably until dark. I decided to leave the woods away from the South Cove, so I took, took the fire road out of the wooded area. Once I made it out of the woods at about 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I called the local police and gave my account. A police officer showed up and investigated the area of my sighting. I talked to the officer after he observed the area, and he said he didn't see anything. He, just, he said that he stood in the area of the cove for five minutes and did not hear any unusual noises, maybe a woodpecker. He said the report would go on record. Logically, thinking about this encounter less than 24 hours, 24 hours after its occurrence, I can only conclude that it was one of two things. One, a very tall man decked out in black from head to toe uh, was seriously trying to mess with me, trying to mess with my head. Or two, my encounter was the real deal. Honestly, I'm still skeptical. I'm giving this incident a 60% chance that it was a real Bigfoot sighting. I did research on your BFRO site, and it is interesting that there was a Bigfoot sighting in the Sykesville, Maryland area near my encounter on May 9th, 1981, almost exactly 40 years ago to the date of my incident. The last thing I can say about this matter is that I honestly wish I did not experience it. I love the woods and am typically in the woods four to six days a week, fishing, mountain biking, hiking with my dog. Now I feel I will constantly be on high alert mode in the woods after this encounter. Yeah, that's the painful part of it. And that, you know, it's, there's so many people that have had encounters with, with some form of Bigfoot and, and it changes their world. It changes how they look at the forest. And, you know, uh, again, if you're not familiar with my story, basically, when I was 14, I was coming down the hill with a friend, uh, a big, uh, it's called a bluff in Minnesota, and, and 
heard a growling that I just described a bit ago as related to that last story. And that changed the forest for me too. I was always in those hills when I was young and, and playing around and, you know, me and my friends would always be dorking around through those, those hills. And, and it, it took me a long time, like a, a matter of about two years before I went back up in there. And even after that, it changed, something changed. And I, did, I didn't spend as much time up there anymore because I didn't feel like it, it, they were just my woods anymore. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was up there. So, again, I didn't have a, a reference point for a Sasquatch at that point in my life. I knew there was Sasquatch, but that was just something in the Pacific Northwest, not in southeastern Minnesota. So I didn't know what to do with it. And it wasn't until much later that I learned about Sasquatch and, and, and the si uh, signs that people attribute to them. And I went back up into those hills and found a lot of them, found tree breaks. I found uh, structures that I don't believe a person made. Uh, I didn't see it get made by a Bigfoot either, so I can't say that with 100% certainty. But there was other things like that. I never found any prints, but because uh, there's mostly leaf litter on the on the ground and branches. It's very untended wood, so it's just very brushy and, and thick with m leaf matter. So I don't know if you could find tr uh, footprints in there. But once I found that, it was like, oh, my gosh. Now I know what that was. But the unknown, I don't know if the unknown was better or not, because the unknown could have been a lot of things, I guess. A dinosaur, a polar bear. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just joking. But I, I didn't know what it was. I know I heard the growl. My friend heard it. But it did change it for me. And so many people uh, have, have lost their passion for the outdoors because of encounters like this. Now, what I would say, and, and even in my case, the, these encounters, as intimidating as they are, they, these things don't go out of their way to hurt us. They don't. Because they could they could kill a ton of people in a, in a hurry. They're so big, so fast, so incredibly adept to their environment, strong, cunning, and intelligent that we would, we would offer no resistance. You know, even armed, you know, that's only a deterrent. And I, I think if, if they were mad enough, they wouldn't really care about that. Uh, they do seem to recognize what firearms are, though. There's plenty of stories out there that, that would suggest that. But whatever they are, um, they don't go out of their way to hurt people. So I, I like to think that there, there are uh, tolerant neighbors, maybe. <laughs> like they know we're out there sometimes, but we're not out there often. And if they can just avoid us, we, we leave the forest pretty quickly after we enter them. So they, they don't seem to go out of their way to cause harm. And maybe it's because they learned. If you hurt people, a lot more people come. And, you know, if you make someone disappear... There's a lot, a lot of people coming to look for that person. And so that probably really disrupts any kind of uh, uh, life for them in that area for quite a while. So I, I think that they know that and they just avoid confrontation with people whenever they can. I think that, you know, perhaps they intimidate people often just to get them out of an area. But, you know, they, they stay pretty reclusive. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that even knowing knowing that and even in Carrie Arnold's uh, experience, if you've ever watched Bigfoot Odyssey or tuned in and, and heard Carrie share his story, he came on the, on the portal and shared his story as well. It's an incredible encounter. He was turkey hunting and uh, was basically confronted by about an eight foot Sasquatch that was pissed and yelled at him, you know, making all kinds of uh, gibberish sounds, much like the, the Sierra sounds. And it was plain view. It came out of a, a out of a, a creek bed and came up to where near he, where he was about, you know, I don't know how many distance it was anymore, but, but it was standing right there looking right at him and rah, 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 rah. <laughs> it, was, it was chewing him out. Now he was armed, but, and it didn't, it didn't move any closer. It didn't go out of its way to try to hurt him, but it just seemed to let him know, Hey, you don't belong here. This is our area. And so, it, it ruined the, f the woods for Kerry for a number of years after that. And he's since been more recently gotten back out and is back to doing some investigating and researching. So I think that that's incredibly powerful. But I think the takeaway is that they could hurt us, but they choose not to. And that's a good place to be. But 
Android says, oh, this is my neighbor, neighboring county. Oh, okay. Same county Lon saw in 1981. When was this? He was also interviewed on Wes's show. Uh, yeah, it's an up. Uh, I don't know if this guy was, but it, the it's on Sasquatch Chronicles blog. Uh, he said it happened in May 8th, 2021. So basically a year ago it happened at approximately 12 p.m., 1230 in the afternoon. So uh, on Eastern time. So ladies and gentlemen, that's all we got time for. Thank you so much for being a part of the journey. Please like the video. Get subscribed if you're not. We love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. Good night, everybody. <laughs>